Forgive us, Lord, for our many failures. But don't forgive us so we can continue making the same mistakes, but help us, Lord, to change, to turn, and to listen to you and receive the blessings that you want to pour out on us. And so teach us, Jesus, in your name. Amen. So I was a few years out of seminary, and it was a Saturday morning, and I was getting ready to set up for a youth night that night, and I was in shorts and a t-shirt, and into the church and into my office walked an affair. I don't mean it was an affair that I was having, it was an affair that was just discovered uh, a few minutes ago, and uh, evidently the first thing that they decided to do was to come to the church, not knowing if anybody was going to be there. And I was the only one there. And I could hear the storm coming down the hallway and they were screaming and yelling at one another. And they got into my office and it took me about five minutes. Have you ever been in a situation like that? You don't know what is going on or what happened at all. And I'm trying to listen, but they're shouting and I couldn't make out anything at all. And then finally it dawns on me because I heard the word affair. I'm like, oh no, I think I know what happened. And I'm thinking, man, they didn't train me for this at the seminary. I'm just a young guy who's in my 20s. I don't know what I'm supposed to do in this moment. And it was frustrating because the the tension level was palpable, where it was almost just you could feel it in the room. And I didn't know what to do. And so when you don't know what to do, a good thing to do is to just stop and go, God, help me. And I shared with them something that I want to share with you. I just said, shut up. (laughs) Now, that's not what God told me to say, but that's what came out of my my mouth um, because I just needed a moment, and they were just screaming and hearing at one another. And then as I heard, I kept hearing him blaming uh, her for this affair that, that he had had. And I stopped and I spoke what I think God spoke to my heart. And maybe some of you need to hear this today. It's very simply, you had a choice. You know what? You had a choice. You didn't have to choose to have an affair. It didn't matter what she did or what she said. She did not have your affair. You made the choice to have the affair. And as he, to his credit, let that sink in for a minute, it changed the tone of the conversation from there on out. And they kept their marriage together. I had a few people ask me after the eight o'clock service, like, well, what happened to them? Oh, yeah, they're still married. They worked things out. But I wonder how many uh, of you haven't worked things out. Because we live in a world that's so easy to just blame somebody else for our mistakes, It's somebody else's fault. It's not mine. I don't have to take personal responsibility for any choices that that I made. And maybe some of you are living, maybe not with an affair that you made a choice to do, but maybe it was another choice. That with the stress of everything that was going on and you just couldn't handle it, and instead of dealing with the emotions and working that out in a healthy way, you grabbed a drink and then another drink and then another drink. And before you knew it, uh, the drink was getting a hold of you and you couldn't live without that drink anymore. You made a choice. You went and grabbed that drink. That's on you. Or maybe some of you are living with broken relationships and somebody offended you, and instead of going to that person to let them know that they've offended you, you you harbor that in yourself, and you began to go out on social media and spread all kinds of things so the whole world would know how you were wronged by this person, and then that got back to them, not surprisingly so, and that the relationship is permanently severed. You had a choice. Or or maybe anger got the best of you in, in a moment. And instead of thinking about what could I have done differently or maybe let me take a step back and and sense where this anger is coming from and why I'm so frustrated, you just lashed out and you're still living with the consequences of of your anger. You, You had a choice. It was your choice. Why do we have a choice? Well, God has always given us a choice and that's why we have choices. That's why we make bad choices because God gives us the ability to make good choices and bad choices. Now, a few weeks ago, if you've been reading through the Bible with us, you came across this verse from Deuteronomy. Moses says, see, I'm setting before you today blessings and curses. 
a choice. Which are you going to choose? Which are you going to choose? Where did the curses come from, by the way? Because I think most of us, if you're watching or you're sitting here today, you're like, I, I don't want curses. No, but none of us sign up for curses. In fact, we would like double portion of blessings. I'll take seconds or maybe thirds on blessings, but hold the curses, please. I wouldn't, but where, where do curses come from? Why are they even here? We got to go back to the very beginning of scripture in Genesis chapter three to find out where the curses came from, where Adam and Eve decided that they wanted to call their own shots. They wanted to be God. They wanted to make their own choices. And they chose to grab a hold of the one tree that they were told out of all the trees, just the one, they grabbed a hold of that and take it and ate from it. And so here's what God says. It's recorded in Genesis chapter three. The Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this cursed, there we are, are you above all livestock and all wild animals? You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. So the serpent is cursed. Just a few verses later, we see another cursing. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground Because of you, through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. You know who didn't get cursed? Adam and Eve. And they're the ones, arguably, that should be the ones to be cursed. And the serpent got cursed and the ground got cursed. But Adam and Eve didn't get cursed in that moment. They have to live with the consequences of their choices, but they weren't cursed but we're still suffering the consequences. Why? Because we're living in a land of curses and blessings. This is a great answer, by the way, to the question, why is there evil in the world? Because we live in a land of curses and blessings, and we get to choose. And the reason there's evil in the world is some people choose not the blessings, but the curses which is a lot better than the answer I used to give when people used to ask me, well, why is there evil in the world if God is so good? And my sarcastic answer to them was, because you're here. (laughs) Because if God wanted to eradicate evil from the face of the earth, none of us would be here. (laughs) Because we all have the ability, and we all do, make choices, bad choices. And we choose curses rather than the blessings. So we live in this land of curses and blessings. And instead of God just throwing up his hands and saying, I'm done with these people and starting another planet somewhere and let's try this experiment again, God rather uh, built in a plan for failure. And that's the purpose of this series. (laughs) Because all of us fail. None of us choose blessings all of the time because sometimes uh, curses are enticing and sometimes we know better. In fact, most of the time, I'd say all the time, we know better. We just go after the curses even though we know we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. And we grab a hold of those things. And so why do we do that? Well, God built a plan for this failure that we do. And the series is going to help us walk through that. What do you do when you fail? Because most people just hunker up in a shell and and they isolate themselves and they load themselves with guilt and shame and and never to sort of emerge from that again. Some people have had their relationship with God destroyed because of the failures they made. Surely God never could love me anymore because of my failure. But God set in place a plan for failure. Three different times in our text in Deuteronomy chapter 30, he has this refrain, turn and obey with all of your heart and all of your soul. This is God's plan for failure. He knew they were going to fail. And instead of one and done, you're out. Make one mistake, I'm done with you. God says, when, when you choose curses, turn back to me and obey me. And turn with all of your heart and with all of your soul. Which leads you to a natural question. Well, how do I know if I've I've done that well enough? How How do I know if I haven't just gone through the motion? Oh, God, forgive me for all my many sins. I know I've done a lot of things, but I'm not gonna get specific about it because I don't really have time and I don't really want to. So just forgive me. How do I know I've done that with all of my heart and soul? 
Because let's face it, even gathering together for, for an hour to celebrate the presence of God and, and come here on a, on a Sunday morning or whenever you're, you're watching this, we can't even pay attention for a full hour, if we're honest. I'll give you a few minutes, but then oh, I was thinking about something else, and oh, my phone buzzed, and I was thinking about something else, and something else was going on, and I'm thinking about tomorrow, and, and we can't even focus for that, and we might give God a, a little bit of time here and there. But to do it with all of our heart, we, we can't. And so God's plan for failure revolves around another plan. Peter, uh, arguably one of the disciples of Jesus, was uh, one of the biggest colossal failures. <laughs> Let me walk on the water, Jesus. Sure, come on out, walk on the water. Walks on the water, takes his eyes off Jesus and begins to sink down there. Man, why, do, why did you doubt, Peter? Jesus said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to die uh, for the sins of the world. And no, you're not going to die, uh, Peter. Get behind me, Satan. And then the day gets closer. And Jesus tells Peter, um, man, Satan just wants to sift you like wheat. I've been praying for you, Peter. He's like, oh, no, I'm going to die with you, Jesus. Jesus, uh, Peter, before the rooster crows three times, you're going to deny you even know me. Failure after failure after failure after failure. And maybe this is why Peter can write these beautiful words, because I think it came from the depth of the despair and the shame that he felt when he understood what Jesus had done for him. He writes us in his epistle in chapter three. He says, for Christ also suffered. Jesus was cursed once for sins. The righteous, he who knew no sin, that's Jesus without any shame or mistakes in him for the unrighteous, that's us. To bring you to God, that is the heartbeat of God. Why Jesus came into the world, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body. He died physically on that cross, suffering for us, but was made alive in the spirit. Thank God it didn't end on Good Friday, that there is Easter Sunday where he rises again, that we know that our sins have been paid for and forgiven. And so now there's really a choice that's laid out before us, two different directions we can go. And you can hear that news that God so loved you that it's not dependent on you turning to God with all of your heart for God to welcome you back home. That God just loved you enough and that the cross paid for all of your sins and that you are welcome home as a daughter, as a son of the living God. And your response is, oh, wow, I can't even fathom that kind of love and that kind of grace. God, how could I ever repay you for what you have done for me? I will worship and serve you all the days of my life. That is one direction, but often not the direction that we take. The other direction probably can be summarized by a question I've heard um, on, with different words um, in different ways. But really, it comes down to this question. If I'm forgiven, why not just live my life any way I want? I mean, if God's gonna love me after all and if Jesus paid for my sins, why not just have a little fun and just go through life? And boy, when I've heard that from people, um, man, my heart aches. I'm like, boy, what kind of faith looks at the grace and the love of God and says, I don't really care. I'm gonna do whatever I wanna do anyway. And I worry about those people because they don't realize how far they are if they haven't already stepped outside of the grace of God and stepped away from faith and rejected the faith that God wanted to give to them. And I so worry about their soul. And I think the writer of Hebrews was worried about souls as well. And he wrote this for those kind of people that want to live that way. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, you hear the grace and the mercy of the name of Jesus, no sacrifice for sins is left. Oh, wow. And I would love maybe to scare people into the kingdom of God, but I I found that not to be really effective for a long period of time. I think a better uh, approach is to help people understand that when you're faced with a choice of blessings and curses, no matter how enticing the curses might be, no matter what promises they make, is to choose, I want to follow you, Jesus, because life with you, Jesus, is better. Life with Jesus is better. 
I mean, how many of us could get up here and talk about, oh, the curses? Oh, yeah, no, uh, curses. Oh, those are great. Those worked out wonderfully in my life. Every time I've chosen curses, it's been great long term. It never works out that way. And so God lays before us this idea. Blessings and curses. And so maybe some of you are here today and God is tugging on your heart. Maybe you're watching today and God is tugging on your heart. You're like, wow, I need to make a U-turn. How, how do I begin to change the direction of my life? Because I've, I bought into that. God's gonna forgive me anyway. I'm just gonna do whatever I want. I don't really care. Or, or, or maybe your life has just gotten that level of chaos where I've made bad decision after bad decision. I've chosen curse after curse after curse. And now I'm living with the consequences. How do I begin to make a U-turn and, and begin to turn my life around? But one, it's not helpless and it's not hopeless. Why? Because there is always hope, no matter how far you are away from God, there is always hope. Why? Because there's always God. And as long as there's breath in your lung, there's still an opportunity for for you to turn around and experience life a different way. There's still an opportunity for you to choose a life of blessings no matter how far you are away. And so if you're hearing that today, that somehow Jesus wasn't enough, that God could never love me because of what I've done, please don't listen to that lie anymore. Because the cross was enough. Jesus was enough. The cross, no matter what you have done, no matter what you're going to do, the cross is always enough. And I hope, if God forbid, any one of you who are watching or here today and, and fall away from the living God, I hope at some point when you find yourself like, what happened to my life? This was never the way I envisioned it to go. That something is ringing in your ears and you're remembering that line, no matter how far you are away from God, like the prodigal son, there is always hope because there's always God and God is still alive and God wants to welcome you home. So if you want to make a U-turn, remember, oh man, there's always hope because there's always God. And two, don't worry about cleaning up your whole life. Just make the next right decision. You don't have to change everything right away. Just make the next right decision. And maybe that next right decision is you're looking at your life and going, I do need to make a U-turn in my life. And maybe it's, I've got some friends in my life that are not helping me to make uh, good choices. I'm choosing curses following them. And so I might need for a season of time, cut out some of these people from my life. And that's the next right decision I need to make. Or maybe my next right decision is I need to get off social media for a while because it is not helping me to make good decisions. It is not helping me to choose blessings. And so I just need to fast a while from that and to turn that off and get away from it for a little while. I don't know what it is that you need to step away from, but make the next right decisions because you're going to fail. You will fail. It's not a matter of if, it's when. And so what do you do when you fail? Well, remember, regardless of what you've done, there's always hope because there's always God. And just make the next right decision. And then finally, let God redeem your failure. Let God redeem your failure. So often what we do when we fail is we like to cover it up. We like to forget about it. We don't want to bring it up. Sort of like Adam and Eve in the garden, let's uh, try to clothe ourselves and hide ourselves from, from God. And, and we like to hide our failures. God says, please don't hide your failures. I want to redeem those failures. I want to use the failures for, for a greater purpose. Here's a little exercise I'll give uh, children, uh, teenagers, um, love for you to do this. And I had a few people over the years take me up on this. If you ever want to just blow your parents' mind, um, sit down with them at one point and say, hey, can, can we have an, just an honest conversation for a minute? I want to share with you some things in my life that I'm struggling with. And then just be brutally honest with them. You know, whatever it is. I, I struggle with my self-worth. I, I don't think I'm valuable at all. I'm struggling with depression. I'm, I'm struggling uh, with whatever substance um, that I'm going through. I'm struggling with X, Y, and Z. And what I've heard from students who have taken me up on that before, they said, I actually did. I sat down with my parents and uh, they were surprised. But then they came back and said, you know what? I struggled with the same thing when I was your age. And why would you hide that? 
why would you not just let that be out in the open? Man, that used to be me, but no longer is that me. I remember that pull and that struggle to choose curses, but God released that for me. Let me share with you some of my struggles so you can learn from my failures so you don't have to make the same mistakes I did. I imagine every parent in this room would say, I would love to have that conversation with my children. Let God redeem your failures. I want to introduce you to a few characters. You might have heard these names before. Uh, The first one is Bill W. Bill W. was abandoned uh, by both of his parents as a child. And he grew up incredibly shy and just awkward, didn't really know how to engage with people. And as he got to be late in teenage years, uh, somebody handed him a drink, and he realized pretty quickly that helped him get over his shyness. And then somebody handed him a stronger drink, and he's like, wow, this is really helping me get through life. And then he grabbed another one and another one and another one. And before he knew it, uh, he couldn't get through any social interaction. He couldn't get through a day without drinking. And by 1933, he had been in the hospital over four times um, for alcoholism to be treated. Some of you know the name Bill W. He went on to be co-founder of AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, which has helped millions of people worldwide be set free from alcohol because they made a choice to grab a drink and then another one and another one and another one. And instead of hiding his shame, he lived that out in the open and helped uh, God, let God redeem that so he could set other people free. Another name is Christine Kane. She too was abandoned by her parents. Her birth certificate didn't have a name. She was adopted and taken into a country she's not familiar with and didn't grow up in and so going to school and because she wasn't like everybody else, she was picked on and then she was bullied and then she was abused. And instead of just hiding uh, in her shame and cowering in that, God did a work in her soul and she leads a ministry called A21 uh, which sets people free from trafficking around the world and thousands and thousands of people have been set free through the ministry that she leads because she doesn't want anybody to experience what she had to experience as a kid. That is God redeeming a failure. And so whether your failure is because of a choice you made or because of a choice somebody else made to you and you're suffering the consequences, let God redeem that failure. This is what he promises to do because there's people who can learn from our failures. If you've grown up in church, you've probably heard Romans 8, 28. Some of you have probably memorized this verse uh, before. We know that in all things, the failures, the bad choices, the chasing after curses, in all things, God works for the good. Did in Bill W.'s life, did in Christine Kane's life, He can in your life too work for all things for the good for those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. So why does any of this matter? Maybe that's a question you're sitting here and we'll sort of wrap up with with this idea. This matters because at some point um, we leave here and our life is is over. And it's much easier to say as a 53-year-old and I realize a lot of people who are a lot younger than I. It's hard to imagine that at some point you come to an end. But at some point, this land we live in where there's curses and and blessings tied together, one day blessings and curses are gonna be separated. Hard to imagine what that would be like, life without COVID, life without cancer, life without brokenness and disease, shame, guilt, All of those blessings and curses one day are going to be separated. Man, I want to live in the blessing category. I want to experience the way life was meant to be lived. And one day when this life is over, this is why this matters. Because the choice we make, are we going to take what God has given to us in Jesus and say, thank you for this gift of faith? Or are we going to say, no thanks? And choose curses. I love the way John writes in the book of Revelation. He's taken up into heaven and sort of see how this whole thing unfolds. And he says, no longer will there be any curse. No longer. I I love that. No longer any curse. The throne of God and the lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. 
Now, unless we gloss over that last sentence there, his servants will serve him. This is different than the way most of us approach our relationship with God. Most of us approach a relationship with God as, I'll, I'll call you when I need you. God, please forgive me. I'm sorry. God, can you help me get out of this situation? God, would you please provide for this? And, and it's almost like a genie in the sky that God is there to serve me and my needs. And what I'm reminded of is that's a horrible way to live with God, and it's not going to lead you to him. I don't know if any of you have ever been in a rental house that you've rented or a condo or something like that, Airbnb. Whenever you're there, and I've always loved this uh, analogy, you know that one locked door that's there? Anybody else frustrated with that one locked door? I have spent hours on my vacations looking for keys around the condo or the house that somehow there's got, they must have left a key in case they forgot to bring one in. I want to know what's in the cat. What is so precious in there? What are you hiding that I can't see it? And I remember one point it dawned on me as I'm looking at a locked door. I wonder if that's not the way our lives look from God's perspective. God, you're welcome to come and visit. In fact, tell you what, I'll come and visit you at your place and then I'll leave click. I'll give you a couple hours on, on Sunday and maybe some time during the week, but, but don't tell me what to do with the rest of my time, click, and we lock off God from our lives. God, thank you for all that you provide for me. Thank you for all the resources and blessings you've poured out on me, and, and I'll give you back a little bit, and whatever I happen to have, whatever I can spare, I'll give to you for your work, but, but don't tell me how I need to manage my money, click, and we lock off another door. God, don't tell me um, how I need to treat other people uh, around me. Click. And we found out we're just locking more and more doors. And all that says is, God, you're not really welcome. I want to choose for myself what I want to do. And so one of the best things we can do today is to do what God invites us to do, is to make a U-turn. Or maybe some of us don't need to make a complete U-turn. Maybe we just veered off just a little bit and it's just a little course correction a little bit today and that's what we're gonna do here in just a minute. But I, I wanna remind you what happens when we do that, when we turn back um, to our living God, when we, we say, I'm, I'm done chasing after curses. God, I wanna follow you and when I fail, I'm gonna get back up and follow you again. And when I fail again, I'm gonna get back up and follow you again. And Isaiah reminds us what that looks like. And he writes these beautiful words. I've swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like a morning mist, just gone. Return me for I have redeemed you. And this morning, we want to give you an opportunity uh, to return and to say uh, as best we can, God, I, I want to follow you. I want to choose blessings today. I know curses sometimes can look enticing, but God, I, I want your help to choose blessings today. I want your help to follow you, Jesus. And I think for a lot of us in this room, the last time maybe we've done that is our confirmation day where we stood up and took responsibility and said, no, I want to follow Jesus. I'll suffer everything, even death, rather than fall away from it. And we want to take an opportunity here at the beginning of the series, and during the season we call Lent, where we remember why Jesus died on a cross, to give you that opportunity to physically respond and have somebody pray over you. Or if you just want to come up and kneel on the, the kneeling rails up here um, to pray and cry out to God, there is something powerful that happens when you physically respond to something that's going on in your spirit. And that's what we want to do today. Normally, we have communion on the first Sunday. And we just thought as a team, as we prayed and reflected on this, we would rather give you the time to respond to God today, to make a U-turn or to make a course correction today. And don't miss the opportunity to connect with Jesus today. And so before we do, I, I want to invite you not just to speak words from your lips, but I want you to declare these to be true. Let this be the warm-up act for our coming forward and returning to God and living a, a life for him. And I will invite you to declare these to be true. Don't just speak them, declare them, and then we'll have an opportunity to come forward and do that. So let's stand and let's declare what we believe to be true about our God as together we declare. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We want to give you an opportunity uh, as we uh, sing this song. And uh, we have prayer partners all over. There's some in the back. So if you don't like coming forward, they're in the back. Just find somebody. They got lanyards on. Uh, these people love to pray and would love to pray with you and for you. And, and let them do that. Just please don't miss Jesus today. If God is calling you and tugging on your heart, let us pray that God just pours out his Holy Spirit into your life so that you don't miss him today. And whenever you feel that, or if you happen to be around somebody that feels that and needs somebody to pray with them, you can always text the word pray to 833-440-0137 and anytime we'd love to pray with you and for you so let's uh, make a u-turn let's make a course correction today and let's choose blessings today let's choose jesus i want to follow you jesus today i need help and so take advantage of the help we have here today with our prayer partners so let's come forward as we sing